Hello, this is John Miller, the creator of The Rest of Everest. I think I can safely say that this show is, without a doubt, the most in-depth look into the entire experience of what it takes to climb Everest, as well as some other peaks throughout the Himalayas. But all of the events in the series are shown in chronological order. So if you're new to the show, please go all the way back to episode 000 and watch everything in order. That's truly the best way to enjoy it. Thanks. This is the Rest of Everest video podcast, an almost unabridged expedition experience. Episode 197, Tales from the Tent. Hey, you. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Rest of Everest. I'm John Miller. Joined, as always, on Season 6 here uh, was Broad Peak and K2. Now it's just K2 with Brian Block. How you doing, Brian? Great. Good to be here. So well, last week, we uh, had the introduction to K2 Base Camp where not very much happened besides snowfall <laughs> and kind of being cooked inside uh, your tent. Welcome to real expedition living. Yeah, five or so days felt like how many, Brian? <laughs> Feels like a week or two when you're just laying there all day and you check your watch again and it's only been four hours. <laughs> and yeah, it's uh, it, it, it lasts forever when the weather's bad. Yeah, I think we'll... Uh, talk a little bit about that this week uh, on the episode. But hey, let's head back up to K2 Base Camp and let's rejoin the expedition. So here we go. Hey, I see blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> and treacherous winds at 120 <laughs> kilometers at the, per hour. Yeah, so we have a whole bunch of photographs. I just kind of uh, transition between them here. This is basically the same view. And so you can see all that wind coming up over. So what are we looking at there? What is that? Those are just clouds getting bent around the mountain as it as the wind is ripping through. So, you know, I think on that day that the summit winds were at like 120K and uh, Camp 3 was like over 70. And so this was a day that we were planning on being up high, but it was also, uh, you know, we decided to give it one more day because we had such a weird, you know, change in the snowpack. We got rain up to 6,200 meters. Almost now I'd have this camera thing figured out. I'm not totally sure what the yellow light means, but... Just the same. Tales from the Tent. July 26th, 2010. Oh, sorry, 25th. Yeah, not even the 26th yet. I'm ahead of the, jumping ahead of the gun. Uh, we spent another two days watching it be crap out pretty much. And uh, what was going to be a summit run, departing tomorrow morning early, uh, trying to get on top on the 29th is uh, come to pass because we found out that... <coughs> Winds are supposed to be about 60k, gusting higher, uh, above 7,500 meters as of the uh, late on the 28th with precipitation coming in and also uh, more snow, rain, crap. And we had rain today. It's actually been really weird. Last night it was really warm. And Luis was up around 2 a.m. and said that the uh, uh, area looked like Scotland with all heavy clouds and just overcast and just junk. Uh, and it's felt like Iowa in September. I mean, just super heavy humidity, wetness, dampness. Everything feels cold because it feels damp because it's just getting inundated with precipitation that isn't really happening. It's just like in the air floating around. So, <laughs> Yeah. And I think the battery died there. But um, yeah, it sounds, sounds miserable. <laughs> Hence the yellow light. Now I know what yeah. that's about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was miserable. I mean, and, and, you know, you try and break the vestibule open and air out your stuff as best you can and get it out in the few glimpses of sunlight you have. And then the clouds pack back in and it kind of shuts everything down again. But it kind of gives you an idea of how scoured most of the route had been. So we are looking at the route here. Yeah, this is kind of off to the side of the flanks that, you know, we climb up into. That's the upper hanging glacier that comes down there right next to camp two and dumps everything down on the Chesan route on the lower section in the lower glacier. So, um, yeah, I just had some time to kill. I was trying to break it up into shots. That's, uh, in that cleft at the top is where you climb up into camp one. Uh, and the lower section down on the lower glacier is where we set up everything to get ready to climb. So we actually climb a lower section. Is 26. We we're actually supposed to start our summit push, but we got news that uh, there's supposed to be 20 centimeters of snow on the 28th and another 15 on the 29th and snow of the century, all kinds of stuff. Not a deal. So, <clears throat> right now, let's see. I can recount for you. I think there are seven or eight people 
up there pushing for the shoulder above camp three which is over in this area here shoulders right there and uh, camp three is just on that slope of the most prominent rock band there that kind of comes horizontally out to us uh, we just sent some people up Megan and Garth wanted to uh, try and sleep a night in camp two which is down there in the rock band and then camp one which is further down not where that tent is obviously <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Chris and I opted not to go play on K2 because, as you can hear in the background, this is the first sunny days in a while, and uh, we've been getting consistent avalanches of all sorts. There's a little guy right there. Just cascading stuff, rock fall, all kinds of things you don't really want to be under. <clears throat> or at least I don't. So, but it is finally a beautiful day and we're getting some charging happening with the uh, solar panels and waiting to hear if there's going to be another weather window coming. We're optimistic about that, I guess, if you can be. And just trying to hydrate and hang out, kill some time. Right now, Fabrizio is the only one on the summit push because there's supposed to be good weather tomorrow, the 27th. Uh, it would have been nice to kind of be on this push, but he's up there with a small group and logistically it doesn't work so I don't know that I was quite ready to go again after my uh, stomach bug unfolding on Broad Peak but what a lot of people don't know is that just right across this Goodwin Austin Glacier here is Broad Peak there it is stunning today some of those clouds cascading over the top hmm. I have to set this down and get a picture quick. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I actually framed uh, one of those versions for myself. I just the triple summits with the uh, clouds kind of cascading over. It's just it's beautiful. Where's yeah, the true so. summit though? Is it uh, the furthest one back and behind it? Yeah, you okay. can't actually see, but like to the right of this photo so, here. As I was saying, this is up on that. Peak right over here on the other side of KT. Really cool cascading winds. I mean. I want to be up there going for the summit like we saw some guys, but you can kind of see the clouds just spiraling off thin wisps. Just up there, what was it, a week ago? Yeah, the Basque team actually came all the way around to this side of the glacier and climbed and traversed those three summits. Whatever. A strip of cloud between the two peaks, two of the three. Pretty cool. And it sounds like, with all the new snow we're about to get, we'll not be going over the Gondogoro Pass due to the fact that it will be snow ridden. I've never gotten to go over that pass. It's usually a good sign to be able to see it, but I don't know about having a lenticular over the top of it. <laughs> yeah, the, the standing lenticular just means high winds. Yeah. And stuff probably coming up the valley is usually a sign of that. So the snow they were predicting, even though it looked cool. beautiful, was probably not out of, out of character. It's like CWX symbol right there. Yeah, this is not sped up, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that is. That's how is fast the winds time. are going. Yeah. Mm funny a lot of people get to there and they have turned around and left you know after they actually see what k2 looks like after having been to other 8,000 meter peaks but just looking at this makes me wish we could go back right away <laughs> <laughs> cool. you know there it is this is at night very difficult to see 
Oh yeah. Maybe two under a partial moonlight. Night of the twenty-sixth. So this is that evening. Summit pushes on. There it is, if you can see it. A little sparkle of light on the shoulder. Fabrizio and I was right tracking. There, looking to push. Yeah, tracking that team. Just got in around eight thirty. But uh, clear night to work for. Hopefully they'll. Uh, a chance to make a push later tonight, early tomorrow morning. Uh, he's going to call back later, apparently. Radio call. He was panty, mm. <laughs> according to Chris. They had just gotten in and they were trying to shovel some platforms and get situated. So it's a long ways from where they're at on the shoulder. You can see the little tiny lights light up, headlamps, to where they need to get. To, up the bottleneck and on the summit ridge, but if anybody can do it, it's probably that group. It kind of depends on the snow conditions. Wish them luck. Yes, yeah, so this is a photograph here. Yeah. Yeah, we had almost a full moon night there. I think the fact that it was behind me kind of almost detracted from it, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I was blissfully optimistic that they were going to be able to get on top with that push. And, uh, of course, the snow conditions did not relent. Now, you know, we haven't discussed this. Had you been on the mountain climbing um, during any of this time? Uh, you know, you were running short on battery power, so maybe you just didn't film it. But had you gotten on at all, gone up to Camp 1 or anything like that? No, there was no Stuck point at, at this camp, point. Yeah. yeah, I was just waiting for the summit run, and actually, like I said, it was a logistics thing. They had a team of six uh, and three tents that were already up high. So could we have jammed me in there? Yeah, maybe, you know, but it was just the weather was not cooperating. And, uh, you know, I mean, they were basically were going head on into, you know, weather that they knew was not supposed to cooperate uh, with the hopes that, you know, the well, forecasters well, were it. wrong, which <laughs> happens a lot. <laughs> What is it? It's July 30th. And uh, admittedly, the tapings have fallen off pretty significantly. So it's been four days. Because nothing has <laughs> been happening. There's pretty much nothing going on. Uh, might be able to hear the sound of the, I'm not sure what it is right now, sleet or sleeting rain or freezing rain or frozen sleet or what it is exactly that's going on out there. But... Uh, I've just been pretty much spending quality time in the tent or in the dining tent or, you know, things of that nature. So, um, yeah, let's see. We got into base camp. Essentially, nothing has been going on for the last week, week and a half. It snowed, I don't even know how much, 10, 15 inches. That finally melted. Avalanches everywhere. Uh, now we've got, what was it, three consecutive days of rain off and on, uh, which got rid of most of the snowpack, uh, but also triggered pretty much endless slides and continuous rockfall. The rockfall has been uh, coming down pretty heavily, pretty consistently. Uh, actually, we've had one guy, Christian Stingle, a mammoth athlete, got hit by a rock in the head wearing a helmet over on the Abruzzi, and then uh, another guy, I believe Yuri, who was climbing with the uh, Polish team, uh, took a rock to the head uh, without a helmet on the Chesin route, uh, and I think he just got down last night, and he was getting attended to, but got down under his own power for the most part, I guess, so that's a good sign. And, yeah, so we've just been sitting in the tent and eating and wasting away and you know motivations ebb and flow from I'm ready to go for it the second the weather breaks and I'm gonna go for the summit to get me some porters and get me the hell out of here <laughs> sitting for a week on end especially knowing I've got family back home working very hard my wife is covering all of the bases with kid and uh, work for the most part I mean I'm doing some general consulting via the sat phone but that's not much considering she's driving hours a day and going through the pre-show rigmarole and all the other stuff that has to happen in order to make sure that uh, things are in place so 
Yeah, you know, to say that it's been a bit of a uh, downer as of late is a bit of an understatement. Uh, although I did get a new barrel. Luis was kind enough to leave me with a barrel, so that was exciting. It's my first real barrel of my own, so I packed some stuff in it just to have. Not as exciting as uh, Fabrizio getting skis from the Dina Fit uh, team, or from Benny, <laughs> but uh, pretty fun just the same. So, you know, I think... Uh, Stressors are pushing kind of hard, tempers are a little closer to the surface, but at the same time it's been a nice, uh, I've been hanging out with some of the guys from the first ascent team, uh, who were going to be a group of six, including Steve House and Vince Anderson, and now are a group of two, which is Dave and Adam, which is uh, just as well, those guys are a lot of fun and uh, good to hang out with, and have had some interesting incidents, everything from a pack falling all the way from camp one, and exploding all over the place, and destroying the one book that seemed to be going around of any interest within base camp, uh, which was Anthony Kiedis's Scar Tissue. Apparently an <laughs> interesting read for base camp time, if you ever find that to be the case. Uh, what else has happened? Dave punched through a false ice wall uh, that apparently hadn't bonded to the rock at all and has about three feet behind it, kind of like a waterfall that, uh, you know, never freezes fully behind it, and uh, while on rappel, and hung from his knee upside down and wedged in an ice crack so uh torqued that pretty good and he's in recovery mode so he's probably not minding too much this weather but they only have till august 20th as it is so as it stands right now i need to be hiking out of camp no later than august 6th august 7th because it's going to take three days probably to get to skardu next day or two i will give myself to try and fly from skardu because i'm much better than the uh kkh drive well uh, and then catch a flight at 3.30 in the morning on the 15th, so really the night of the 14th. So i got to be in Islamabad by then, and i got stuff to sort out, things to store for a return trip. So, you know, and I'm already plotting and planning the next couple of outings, adventures, trips, plans. The wife booked us tickets to Australia, and initially I, you know, was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, but since she's been doing all the work, I figure it's fair to, uh, let her take me on vacation if she wants to go <laughs> and bring me for that matter but uh so we're gonna go down there and actually get to see a couple of the guys from the trip it sounds like ben kane's gonna come over uh to sydney and we're gonna see a john butler trio show and then we're gonna go down to adelaide where rob lives rob baker uh who was one of my favorite people to meet on the trip and then we are going to uh, do some wine tasting and hanging out down there, but I realized also, hey, I could tag Kosius go while we're down there, and, you know, not officially, but officially, but whatever, get one of them out of the way for the seven, depending on whose lists you look at, which would be nice. And I already asked the wife if she wants to go to Aconcagua. Apparently, she's less enthused about that now with the baby, which is totally fine, but it was a goal of hers at one point, so, uh, and already looking at Karsten's Pyramid maybe in January and back to uh, do some climbing over in Everest with Charlie for stuff uh, in March, May and uh, then maybe back here to Nanga Parbat for a short four weeks Shh, don't say anything about my wife yet I haven't even broached that one uh, you know, but it just kind of depends <laughs> on how things shake out so uh, yeah just uh, trying to stay dry right now <laughs> Hanging out in base camp. This blows. <laughs> totally. But, uh, yeah, I look forward to actually getting home. It's amazing how fast the time is going now. You know, I really only have a week uh, here, so unless something shakes out, because we're going to need three days on the mountain minimum. And they're talking about this weather not breaking until the 5th or 6th, which sounds horrendous, and I'm sure there'll be more video footage of me losing myself <laughs> right into oblivion because I hate this weather hate it hate it, hate it, hate it I'm bored of reading I'm bored of listening to music I think I've listened to all of it twice made like 10 playlists and re-listened to them don't want to write in the journal much anymore I think I've pretty much filled two books writing on everything, planning for the next year, I'm putting together an itinerary, telling my wife I miss her, talking to my son so he can read it someday, all kinds of stuff. And the uh, 
DVD player pretty much won't charge because I can't get enough sun to you know, do that, so I can't even watch episodes of anything. And of course, the began and the uh, computer were pretty much worthless weight to bring. I think I got that to work for all about two minutes before the began battery died. So, I've been trying to charge stuff, but again, no light, no charge. So, just killing time here in base camp. Surprisingly not killing myself, I guess, but, you know, whatever. I mean, I guess I do have to remember, you know, that there's so many days we work, so many hours that being able to sleep 12 hours a night or 15 hours a day is uh, kind of a gift. And I need to relish it. I have to make a logical, objective observation about that and remind myself to enjoy the fact that I have to do nothing and go nowhere. But I'm trying not to slip into lassitude either. Good times. Anyway, hope things are well back home and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, it looks like you're starting to achieve a certain <laughs> zen <laughs> about the situation. Or are you just so <laughs> disgusted by it you can't even oh, stand it? Yeah. Riveting stuff, I know. It's uh I said there couldn't be any more truth than watching that and boy I uh I remember that very well. And yeah, it's uh you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's like trying to remember, you know, all the things to be grateful for every day and you know, I mean especially now with two kids running around and a third one starting. Well, I relish those days when I had nothing to do and nowhere to be <laughs> and no one to watch out for, uh, you know, but at the same time, yeah, it's, uh, you feel trapped when you're there in that kind of situation. You can't get the stuff done you're there to do and you can't do anything back home. And, you know, Pakistan's one of those few places these days where you literally can be completely off the radar. I mean, you know, there'd be days where the sat phone wouldn't even work because of the cloud coverage and like I said, the began and the computer didn't work, and so you're just sitting there basically trapped in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, so for all of you of wanting to just disappear from the middle of nowhere, this is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. After about a week, I guarantee you'll be tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, the weather does uh, eventually break uh, for, for a period, and we do get on the mountain. Um, does it happen next episode? I can't tell you right now because I haven't edited it yet. So I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what next episode will contain, but uh, I'm going to guess it's going to involve some tents, some snow, some rock, and a mountain uh, out there somewhere. So uh, yes. thanks as always, Brian. I love watching this footage because it's just, this is the real deal. And, yeah. Uh, it's great to, is... great to see all of it. Not no just gloss. The highlight reel. Yeah, as I was say, this is when you know it's real because it's not that fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. We will see you next week. Take care and bye. Bye. The rest of Everest has been watched millions and millions of times all over the world since 2006, and it's all been free, but it's not free for me. If you're a fan, then let me know. You can like the rest of Everest on Facebook, write a review on iTunes, subscribe on YouTube, or even help me pay the bills with a financial donation. It doesn't take much, and quite literally, your donations make this show possible. They honestly pay for everything. You can make a one-time donation or set up a monthly contribution through my website. Help me out, and I'll give you a download of our film Everest The Other Side, as well as some other goodies. Thanks as always to our announcer Marlon May from MarlonMay.com, and to Wendy Wu for providing the show's theme song. Find her on iTunes or at WendyWu.com. Thank you for watching The Rest of Everest. For more information about the show and upcoming expeditions, be sure to visit therestofeverest.com.